So I'll go uh, rapidly through this material because it's already been given to you in the form of a tutorial. Suppose I have a battery and the battery of course has a positive terminal and a negative plate and connected with this battery is a simple circuit. Connecting wires and a resistor, which, as you all know by now, can be modeled by a thin piece of wire. So current is flowing through this circuit. Now current is flowing, which means that there is an electric field inside the wires. The electric field is axial with the conductors inside the wires. It's uniform. Here the electric field is going to be large because of the thin cross section. It's the same material, by the way, even though this is a thinner piece of wire. And then there is the axial electric field. Inside the battery, the electric field seems to be pointing in the wrong direction. And this is a large electric field because this distance, even though I've drawn it in an exaggerated form on the blackboard, is small. So the round trip electrical field's line integral is zero. E dot DL is zero around this round trip. So this is a, the axial electric field inside the conductor. All right. Associated with this electric field is, of course, there is a current density, J. That current density is parallel to the electric field. Here, this is the direction of the current density. The current throughout the circuit, which is the current density times the cross-sectional area, remains constant. So here the current density is going to be large because the electric field is large. Remember that the current density is a point concept. You have currents through areas, but current density at a point. So this is something that we're all quite familiar with by now. How are these electric fields produced? Abutai, inside the wire? By surface charges. There is a gradient of surface charges. So this positive charge is going to dilute itself around the circuit. This negative charge is going to dilute itself around the circuit. So these surface charges experience a concentration gradient. And because of that concent uh, concentration gradient, the electric field exists inside the conductor, which makes the current density and the current goes around. Now, if this were an electric light bulb, it would give us heat and energy. If this were an electric iron, it would give us thermal energy. If this were a motor, it would give us mechanical energy. We could do useful work with it. So energy is evidently being utilized here. That energy must be coming from somewhere. Now, where is that energy coming from? First of all, <clears throat> generally, textbooks deal with this question in a very hand-waving way. What they argue is that if one were to plot the potential around this circuit, the so potential as a function of x, where x is some curved variable that goes all around the circuit, and we take this point to be 0. So this is some point A, B, C, D. So you go all around the circuit, and if you would like to plot the potential, What's going to happen is that from this point, suppose this is at some potential V0, from this point to the, to the resistor, so this is A, this is B, this is C, and then this is D. C and D are close together. So this point is also D. So we're going in a complete loop around the circuit. If we were to plot the potential change, the potential changes only slightly in the region from D to B, D to A. The reason is that this is a high conductivity material, so the electric field is going to be small. Small electric fields are required to produce sufficient currents in, in a good conductor. Nevertheless, there is going to be an electric field, which I've shown in white here, 
that will cause a change in the potential. The slope of this line is just the electric field inside this wire. From A to B, the electric field is large. This distance is small, which means that the slope is going to be large. From B to C, once again, you have a sloping line. The slope is gradual, which means that the electric field here is smaller than the electric field inside this thin piece of wire. Eventually, at point C, you come back to zero potential, supposedly. And from C to D, inside the battery, your potential is going up because the current density is opposite to the direction of the electric field. You're circambulating the path in a direction opposite to that of the electric field. And since this distance is really small, even though I've exaggerated it on the blackboard, a battery is really small and the circuit can be large. So from C to D, the original potential is restored. So the electric field is going to be really large inside the battery. And at point D, you're at the same potential where you started off from. So you take a round trip of this circuit, E dot D, and it's going to be zero. You take the slope here, the slope here, the slope here, and the slope here. These are three negative slopes. You add the three negative with the one positive slope, you get zero. And this is what the Faraday's law really is. Right? This is Faraday's law for non-changing magnetic fields. This is a steady current, so there is no changing magnetic field here. There is no con non-conservative electric field. So what generally authors do is that they would say that, all right, let's multiply this potential with the energy, with the charge on electron to get the potential energy. So what they argue is that if electrons are drifting, they are, of course, drifting. This is the drift velocity. That's the drift velocity of the sea of electrons. If the sea of electrons is all moving in a gradual, giant march from point D to C and back to D, the speed is really small, a few millimeters per second. So if you multiply this potential with the charge, you get the potential energy. So generally it is argued that the potential energy of the charges decreases as you go from D to A. It decreases even further as you go from A to B. That decrease in potential energy appears as energy that is available for other purposes. For example, it may appear as the kinetic energy of the electron, which appears as thermal energy, and you heat up a light bulb. And then you restore the energy as you go from C to D. But there are certain problems with this approach. One problem is that everything, this energy transfer is instantaneous. So you switch on and off an electric light bulb, it immediately switches on, even though the EMF source may be in Tarbela or Mangla. So in charge, energy transfer is instantaneous. If the drifting sea of electrons were to contribute to this energy transfer, it, could, it would fall short of a good explanation because energy transfer is instantaneous. The second problem is that if I reverse the polarity of this battery, which means if I had an AC source instead of a DC source, even then the light would light up. So for an AC source, what's happening to the electric field is that inside the wire, it's constantly changing its direction. So if I were to plot the magnetic, the electric field's magnitude inside the wire with time, in an AC source, it's constantly changing its direction, which means that the current density is constantly changing its direction. But how can energy still transfer from the electric from the battery to the electric light bulb if the flow of current has now reversed. It's reversing at some frequency. So this AC description is unwarranted. It, it cannot be described by this simple, naive approach of energy transfer from the battery to the, to the resistor. But indeed, energy is coming out of somewhere. It's becoming available. So how do we, and, and by the way, this approach would say that the energy of the electrons is smaller here than here. It's even smaller here because the electrons are falling downhill on a potential, so their energy is going down. Or if you talk about electrons, electrons are increasing their energy, but if you consider positive charges, the positive charges have a large energy here. They have a small energy here. So if you consider the flow of positive charges, the energy of the positive charges is gradually diminishing as we go around the circuit, but that's not true. 
a light bulb placed here will glow with the same brightness as a light bulb placed here, as a light bulb placed here, as a light bulb placed here. So this concept of gradual energy transfer in the wires which is mediated by connection electrons or by mobile charges is not correct. It's a naive approach. It does not explain the different kinds of observations that, we, that I've described. So we have to come up with an alternative description. And the tutorial was focused on an alternative description. The alternative description is based upon the fact that I can define a new object which is called a pointing vector. I denote it by S, it's a vector, so I put an arrow on top of it. And this is really a cross product between an electric field and a magnetic field. And I divide this by mu naught. So we know what the electric field is, we know what a magnetic field is. The cross product is called the pointing vector. This tells us the flow of energy per unit area per unit time. So it's intensity per unit time. It's the flow of power per unit area. And this is through a surface. So if I were to take a surface, and on this surface there was an electric field pointing upwards, and a magnetic field, for example, that was pointing out of the plane of the black hole. So E and B were normal. So electric field is upward, magnetic field is out of the plane of the back blackboard. If I take the cross product E cross B, I get a pointing vector that is pointing in the right direction. This really means that energy is flowing through this surface. And S gives you two things. It gives you the direction of energy flow. Energy is flowing from left to right here because this is what E cross B tells us. The second thing is that it tells us how much energy is flowing per unit area, per unit time of the surface. That's given by the local cross product of E and B. So the units of S would be watts per meter squared. So now let's try to use this concept to determine which direction the energy is flowing in inside the circuit. For that, we have to know what the electric fields are and we have to know what the magnetic fields are. All right? So let's suppose these wires are really thin. So let's talk about the electric and magnetic fields outside in the close vicinity of the circuit and see what the relative orientation of the electric and the magnetic fields are. And let's, from that information, try to deduce what the pointing vectors are. Do you have any questions up to this point? It's important you understand this, otherwise you'll falter with me. You will not follow. Any questions? This concept of pointing vector is generally introduced to students when they are first exposed to electromagnetic waves. But the pointing vector is a more general concept. Even when you're looking at DC circuits, AC circuits, this concept is equally valid. So this is an unusual approach of introducing the pointing vector. We look at it again next week in the context of electromagnetic waves, nevertheless. Any questions? <coughs> I'm going to redraw the circuit. Positive terminal, negative terminal. Charge gradient on the surface.
Now what we would like to draw is the electric field pattern outside this circuit, in the immediate vicinity of the circuit. But before I draw the electric field, let's draw the magnetic field. It's easier to figure out what the magnetic field is. If this is the direction of the polarities, is there a magnetic field around the circuit, outside the circuit, just outside the wires? So here, up, G, up. Okay, that direction. What would be the direction of the magnetic field here? Upwards? Left, to the left, into the plane of the black pole. Right. So let's draw the magnetic fields. Outside here, the magnetic field is going to point into the plane of the black pole. Here is going to point outwards. Right? So this is the direction of the current flow. Inwards, outwards. So in yellow, I'm drawing the magnetic fields. What's the direction of the magnetic field here? Here. Inwards. Inwards, outwards. Here, once again, outwards, inwards. Outwards, inwards. Right, the current is flowing in this direction. Inwards, outwards. Here the current is flowing in this direction. So, inwards, outwards. Now, if I'm at the same distance from the wire, is, is this magnetic field going to change? So, I have a steady current. The current is not changing. It's a DC circuit. Is this magnetic field going to be the same as this magnetic field if I'm at the same distance from the wire? It's going to be the same because the current is the same throughout this circuit. So if you're at the same distance from this wire, which means that this distance is the same, then this magnetic field is going to be the same, ampere flow. So I've drawn the magnetic field around the circuit. Now a simple circuit, you've seen that there's an electric field inside the wire. There is going to be a magnetic field inside the wire as well, we know that. It's going to vary linearly as the distance from uh, the center, then it's going to drop linearly outside the wire. We know that from Ampere's law. There's a magnetic field. There's a structure of a field that builds around the circuit. An innocuous circuit, a simple circuit, has a rich magnetic field structure around it. Now let's look at the electric field outside the wire. So far we've been dealing with electric fields inside the wire. But now we have to talk about electric fields outside the wire. Because we would like to construct a cross product of E and B. So we know what the field is outside the wire. We need to know what the electric field outside the wire is. <coughs> All right. So I know that inside the wire, there will be some electric field. It's going to be largely axial. There could be some other components as well because the surface charges. But we are concerned right now about the electric field outside the wire. Suppose I have a piece of wire. Suppose the current is flowing through this wire and it's a steady current. Now the electric field inside is going to be parallel to the Largely, it's going to be parallel to the, uh, to the current density. But remember that there are surface charges on this wire. Which make this electric field in the first place. Now, inside the wire, there is an electric field. But these surface charges on the wire also produce an electric field. 
Remember, this is not a condition of equilibrium. Otherwise, the electric field inside would have been zero. But since we have current flowing, there is the possibility of electric field inside the wire. Now, these surface charges are really small, which means that any electric field that they are going to be, they are going to produce, is small. But if this is a constant surface charge density on the surface, no electric field will be produced inside the wire because of these surface charges. That is, there will be no radial component of the electric field. The electric field is entirely in the axial direction, and we've seen that already. Inside the wire, the electric field is totally in the axial direction. There can be no electric field into the wire in the radial direction because on this path, on this point, if you draw a loop, there is a constant surface charge density. It's the gradient along the length of the wire that makes the electric field. So there is no radial electric field inside the wire. The electric field inside the wire is totally axial. But what about outside the wire? Outside the wire, the electric field could point in any direction it likes, which is but dictated by the Maxwell's equations. So now if this current is density is uniform, which means that the current is uniform, outside this wire, we have a charge. So forget about the, the axial field. Let's look at the radial field. Radial means something that goes along the radius of this wire. Axial is something along the axis. So there, there is more charge here, more positive charge here. There is less positive charge here. <coughs> so by just looking at these surface charges, there is going to be <coughs> a radial electric field that is larger here and weaker here. And it's even weaker here because the surface charge is smaller here. Because of the surface charge gradient, outside the wire there is an electric field that is pointing radially outwards, like this. So it is pointing in all directions in a radially symmetric way. I have only drawn a longitudinal section here. So due to these surface charges, there are radial electric fields pointing outwards, like the spokes of a wheel. And these electric fields are not the same, because the charges are not the same. The charge gradients were required to establish the electric field inside the wire. So outside the wire we have these radially pointing outwards electric fields. Okay? If these were negative charges, the fields would be pointing inwards. In this section of the wire there are negative charges on the surface. Alright? But this is only the radial component. What about, is there any component parallel to the, to the wire, outside the wire? If not, yes. Why? Not an impedance path, but a Faraday loop. Yes. Correct. There has to be an electric field along the axis outside this path as well. Why? Because if I were to draw a path like this, And I traverse this path, say, in the clockwise fashion, like this. So one end of this path is inside the wire. The other end of this path is immediately outside the wire. Okay? Now the electric field is the same, is uniform inside the wire. It doesn't matter how much you go inside the wire, the electric field along this path is independent of how much you go inside the wire. But nevertheless, there is an electric field inside the wire. Correct? So if you take a path that is along the axis, there is a non-zero dot quadrant of electric field with this path. And now, if you look at this ampedian path, it has a surface, an area inside it. So if I look at Maxwell's equations, E dotted with dl around the closed path must equal negative of the time rate of change of flux, magnetic flux through this path, through this area. So this path bounds an area. How much magnetic flux passes through this area and how much of it is changing with time? 
no doubt there is magnetic flux to this surface because there is a magnetic field which is pointing spirally which is circular there is a magnetic field through this area shown in green inside the quark but it's not changing with time because the current is not changing with time so since this is a steady current there no doubt there is magnetic flux but the time rate of change of magnetic flux is zero in other words there are no non conservative electric fields hence e dot dl about this green path has to be zero now if you look at the right hand side this electric field is say e parallel parallel to the axis e parallel into the length of this path that i've chosen l now around this path suppose there is some electric field that i need to determine e e dash l this has to be equal to 0 this means that e dash has to be equal to e parallel and i've taken a minus sign here which means that i'm assuming that whatever e e e dash i have is going to be pointing in the downward direction because that will ensure that this e dash is its dot product this path is negative <coughs> so this can only be satisfied if the field in the immediate vicinity outside this wire is equal to the field inside so if there is an electric field inside e parallel there has to be an equal electric field just outside the boundary in the axial direction because that will ensure that if i draw a faraday path the line integral of this electric field configuration about this path is going to be zero this is going to give a positive contribution this is going to give a negative contribution because the path is being traversed in the upward direction where the field is pointing downwards so just outside this wire the electric field inside leaks out as well it has to be the same on the other side of the boundary if a steady current is flowing so outside this wire we have a complicated arrangement we have axial fields and we also have radially outward outward fields so let me redraw this circuit this wire in fact there is a uniform axial electric field inside nothing else outside this wire right in the vicinity of this wire there is going to be an axial electric field which is the same magnitude as this as the field inside because of faraday's law here because of one of maxwell's equations the current is steady however because of these surface charges there are radially outward components which are varying with the distance along this wire this is a large radial component this is a small radial component a smaller radial component an even smaller radial component because the charges are getting smaller on the surface correct likewise we'll have a field configuration in the same manner in this way the axial field remains constant and the radial field drops in magnitude so now the electric field outside is just a resultant of these electric of the axial and the radial components here the field is largely axial because the radial component is small so this electric field outside is twisting with position along the wire here it's radially outward where the charge is large it's largely radially outwards and then it's gradually rotating it's curling as you move around this conductor 
because the radial component is diminishing, the charge is diminishing, but the axial component remains constant. So this is the net electric field. It is curling as we go around the circuit. Now, if this were a negative wire, a negative portion of the wire, which means we have a charge distribution which is negative, <coughs> the direction of the electric field outside axial is going to be uniform. And then there is going to be an inward pointing electric field, a small field here, a larger field here, and even larger field here, because the negative charge is large. So if you look at the resultant of these electric fields, this is going to be an electric field largely pointing like this, like this. This is also going to twist inwards, right? It's twisting inwards. Now we have this formulation and we can plot the electric fields in the circuit. Let's draw the electric field inside the circuit. I'm going to draw these electric fields in blue. In this region, for example, there is a strong electric field. And that electric field is pointing in this direction. Strong electric field. And it's only axial. There are no surface charges on the curved surface of the battery. Here, the electric field inside is large. And the electric field outside is small because the surface charge has been neutralized. They're, both of these positive and negative charges have diluted to an extent that this is effectively neutral on the surface. So there are no surface charges here. This is a symmetric this circuit. So even though the electric field inside is large, there are no surface charges. So outside the electric field is going to be totally axial. Let's see what happens here. There is some surface charge, there is an axial electric field, but the surface charge is small. So the field is largely going to be somewhat close to the axis. Here, there is a large surface charge, large axial field. So this is going to be pointing away from the surface. Here, the surface charge is really large. So, and there is some electric, axial electric field. So this electric field is going to be pointing generally in the radially outward direction. Okay, I've just mapped this diagram on, onto <coughs> here. I'll give you half a minute to think about this. I can do a, I can do a more elaborate construction, never, nevertheless. In yellow, I'm going to draw the electric fields. Axial, the axial component remains the same. Here, the axial component is large. 
the axial component doesn't change because this is just the field inside here this is the axial component this is large so this is the axial component of the electric field outside the wire now I'm going to draw the radial components here there is no radial component here there is a large radial component because the charge here is large a smaller radial component and it's positive an even smaller radial component because this charge is smaller the charge is diluting as you go around the circuit here there is hardly any radial component because the, the charge is so dilute and it's effectively at the middle of this circuit so there's no like no, no charge here on the surface but the charge gradient is large because it's positive and negative that's why the axial field exists but there is hardly any radial component now look here the radial component is now pointing in the inward direction it's starting to point in the inward direction because this is a negatively charged surface then you have more negative charge a bigger inward pointing radial component the axial component remains the same here an even bigger radially inward pointing component so this is the axial and the radial component of the electric field and the net electric field will just be the resultant now I'm going to draw the net electric field You see, here the field is pointing in the outward direction, away from the wire. Then it's twisting and becoming parallel to the wire, gradually as we go around the circuit. Here it's parallel to the wire. Then it starts to, it starts to converging into the wire. Alright? Now let's look at the magnetic field. Once again, I have already drawn the magnetic field. The magnetic field here is inward, outward. 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 So now I have the complete configuration of electric and magnetic fields outside the wire in the immediate vicinity of the wire. Now at each point I would like to calculate the pointing vector. And I am really interested in finding out the direction of the pointing vector so that I can determine which direction is the energy actually flowing in. So let me draw these pointing vectors in green. Remember that the pointing vector is E cross B. Let's see what the pointing vector here is. E is in that direction and the magnetic field is outwards. So electric field crossed with B pointing vector downwards. I'm drawing the pointing vectors in green. These are the pointing vectors. What about the pointing vector here? Electric field in that direction, magnetic field inward, pointing vector upwards. <coughs> Let's look at, for example, the electric field here. Uh, sorry, the pointing vector here. Elec magnetic field outward, electric field electric field is like this 
So the pointing vector is going to point like this. Here the pointing vector, the electric field like this, the magnetic field into the plane of the black board, okay? So E cross with B. This is the direction in which the pointing vector is going to point. Remember, it's normal to the electric field and to the magnetic field. So you draw a vector just normal to this electric field here because it's a cross product. The magnetic field is pointing inwards anyway, so it's this pointing vector is in the plane of a blackboard. It's normal to this net electric field, E cross B. It has to be normal to both E and B. B is into the plane of the blackboard anyway, so it has to be normal to this. So energy is flowing like this. Here energy is flowing out of the battery. Let's see what, what's happening here. Here, above the resistor, the electric field is pointing like this, the magnetic field is pointing outward, the pointing vector is pointing like this into this piece of wire. So energy is flowing into this piece of wire, into this resistor. Below this piece of wire, the electric field is still pointing to the right, the magnetic field is pointing inwards, so the pointing vector is pointing upwards. So here the pointing vector is pointing upwards. Likewise here, the electric field is pointing like this, magnetic field inwards, so pointing vector points downwards like this. It's It's normal to this pink vector. Here the pointing vector is going to point like this. Let's look at the pointing vector here. The electric field is pointing in the downward direction, magnetic field in inside. So this is the direction in which the pointing vector is pointing. Uh, electric field downwards. Uh, if the electric field goes downwards, okay. Let's look at the look at the pointing vector here. The electric field is like this. Magnetic field is out. So this is the direction in which the pointing vector is pointing, and here this is the direction the pointing vector is pointing. So now look at the circuit and. Bring this concept into your minds, into your graphical memory. What's happening here is we've set up electric and magnetic fields outside the circuit and we've calculated or qualitatively seen the direction of the pointing vectors. The pointing vectors are pointing outward from the battery. So energy is flowing outward from the battery and is flowing into the wires. Here the point energy is flowing into the wires. Here the energy is flowing into the wires. Here the energy is flowing into the wires. Here the energy is flowing into the wires. And in fact, in this region, where the resistance is large because the wire is thinner, the pointing vector is normal to the axis of the wire. So it's all of this energy is concentrated towards this resistor, towards this thin piece of wire, where there's no charge on the surface. So generally, from this diagram, you can well imagine that energy is flowing outwards from the battery, it's radiating outwards from the battery and it is culminating into the wire, it's concentrating into the wires. They are sucking energy. This resistor is sucking the most energy. Most of the energy is being delivered to this resistor. So generally energy is flowing outwards from the battery and into the wires. If this were a perfect conductor, how would the scenario change? Suppose all of these thick wires were perfect conductors. What's going to happen then? What about the surface charges on a perfect conductor? How about that? G. G. If the perfect conductor ho, to uske surface pe kya charges honge? G. Muchi bolo. सर्फिंग चार्जेस नहीं होंगे, बिल्कुल नहीं होंगे, क्योंकि J equals sigma E, 
if this is infinity, conductivity is infinity, and you would like to keep the current density finite, you cannot have infinite currents. The electric field has to be zero. So in a perfect conductor, like a superconductor, no electric fields exist, which means that there is no need for surface charges. So if this was a perfect conducting wire, if all of this was perfect, I can redraw this circuit. <coughs> no surface charges means no electric field inside. given by 1 over mu naught e cross with b. 
Now E and B are normal to one another, so the angle between them is 90 degrees, so sine of 90 is 1. Here they are also almost normal to one another because there is no charge here. The field is entirely, electric field is entirely axial and the magnetic field is entirely circular into or out of the plane of the black hole. So this is the magnitude of the energy going into this resistor per unit area, per unit time. And I'm assuming that all of this energy is going in to the curved surface. It has to because the pointing vector is radially inwards to this. So if I look at this resistor and I look at the cross section of this resistor, this is R. So the pointing vectors around this resistor, they're all pointing inwards. So now what I need to do, I would like to calculate the total power per unit area that goes into this. Now I know what the electric field is. If, if the potential difference across this piece of conductor is delta B, there has to be potential drop inside the circuit here. Look here, from point, this point to this point, from A to B, there is a potential drop. So if this were perfect, this potential would remain constant from D to A, then it would drop, and then it would remain constant, okay? So there is a potential drop, and if you put a voltmeter here, of course you measure a potential difference. So there is a potential drop delta B. Now the electric field E, is given by delta V over L. We all know that. In other words, VB minus VA is the line integral of V dot DL. Okay? So this is the electric field. So I know what the electric field is. Remember in practical circuits, you can't measure electric field directly. So you can measure voltage, you can measure intensities. What about B? B depends upon the current. If I use Ampere's law, B into 2 pi capital R is mu naught i, which means that my B is mu naught i over 2 pi R. So I put this B in here. All right. So I put the E in here, I put the B in here. So what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to remove these field concepts and bring in circuital concepts. Because fields are difficult to measure in the laboratory. You can't measure electric fields directly even though you can, but it's easier to measure potentials or because you have voltmeters or intensities because you have photodetectors or detectors that measure intensity which is the square of the electric field. Okay? It's difficult to measure magnetic fields. You, you, you need Hall sensors or different magnetometers. It's easy to measure currents. So I'm trying to replace these field concepts by circuital concepts. Because I know what the power dissipated in a resistor is in terms of the voltage and the current. So I put in these values. I have S equals 1 over mu naught. My E is delta V over L. My B is mu naught i over 2 pi r. So this mu naught goes away. I'm left with delta v into i over 2 pi r l. This is in watts per meter square. Now the total power that goes into the circuit, which is the energy that goes into this resistor per unit time, will be this pointing vector multiplied by the area to which energy is coming into this circuit, into this resistor. And that's just the curved surface area, that's 2 pi RL. So the power that is coming into this circuit, P, which is S into 2 pi RL, is simply I delta V. But what's this? This is Ohm's law. The power that is delivered to a resistor by a battery is just Vi. It's just the potential drop across that resistor into the current. 
and that power is coming from the pointing vector. The pointing vector adequately quantitative in a precise way determines how much energy is going into the resistor. So this is a beautiful concept because we've used a field concept. We used a field concept to and to bring home an idea that you're already familiar with from your secondary school, that is the Ohm's law. So everything can be described in a consistent fashion using field concepts. Now what I am trying to do here is, is a demonstration that was really hard to build, even though it looks very simple. But it's quite, quite a feat actually. It took me quite a bit of time to actually build this and think about it. The reason what I would like to do, I've been talking so much in this course about surface charges on conductors. So much about, about those. But I haven't yet shown you those surface charges. It's difficult to show surface charges because they are so feeble. They're extremely weak. Maybe of the order of nanocoulombs or picocoulombs, possibly nanocoulombs. So they are really small charges and they are hard to show. So I have, what I have here is, okay, let, let's wait for this to turn up. There are surface charges on the conductor which make the current go around in the first place. That current produces a magnetic field. All right, Maxwell's laws tells us that there has to be electric field outside. So there's a distribution of electric and magnetic fields outside. That produces pointing vectors. The pointing vector is in the general direction that energy is emanating outward from the battery and going into the resistor. Let's look at the circuit. But so what we have here is I have a battery, a 5 volt battery, and that battery is connected to these two objects. These objects are high voltage converters. Each of these takes in 5 volts and gives 10,000 volts. So it's a miniature high voltage DC converter. It's a solid state device. We have two of them. All right, why do we have two of them? Let's draw a diagram of what I'm trying to achieve here. supply of 10,000 volts. This center is grounded. So I have a positive terminal and a negative terminal and I connect five resistors.
in as much a symmetric fashion as I could. Each one of these resistors is say roughly 50 mega ohms. So this large voltage drop, which is about 20,000 volts, makes a current flow in the circuit. I cannot have large currents because these miniature devices cannot deliver a large current. So I have these high resistors. But I need a sufficient amount of current to build up a sufficient electric field inside the wires so that there is there is a noticeable distribution of surface charges. So what I'm seeing here is at one end I will see negative charges being built up. Here I would see positive charges being built up. Here generally I would see no charge because of the symmetry of the circuit, because of the topology of the circuit. And there's a gradual dilution of charges. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a plastic rod and from that plastic rod, I have an insulating thread and I have a small aluminum aluminum ball that is tied to this thread. So it's conducting, but this is an insulator. So I will move this thread here. I will touch it with this surface charge. And some of the negative charge will develop on this ball, on this piece of metal by conduction. So I touch it, some of the mobile electrons, some of these charges, these are all mobile, they will go on to this aluminum metal ball and this will become negatively charged. Now this negatively charged, when I bring that ball once again close to this piece of wire, it should feel a repulsion. It should feel a kick. Okay, now this is a minute effect and I hope I can show this effect to you in this demonstration. And when I bring this negatively charged sphere close to this positively charged end, this sphere should ideally attract, it should stick to this. But when it sticks to this, it immediately neutralizes and then it takes a positive charge and starts repelling again. So this other effect is hard to see, but this is more noticeable. But it's, it's a very feeble effect, so you have to pay close attention. Or after the class, you can come and do it for yourself. But remember, these are high voltage demonstrations. You can't do them unsupervised. All right, they're not fatal experiments because the charge delivered, which is actually painful, is really small. The current is really small. It's below our threshold of detection. Okay, let me see if I can show this effect. I turn on this power supply. You could see the five resistors in the circuit. These are the high voltage converters. This is the battery that is delivering power to these high voltage converters. This is my magic wand. Okay, okay this is it. Now I'm going to bring this close to the. Ali, you have to do something. I'll I, I, move Okay, so this is my, you can see the aluminum ball, I try to bring this close to it, I touch it, you can see the repulsion. I'm holding my hand fixed, as soon as it touches this piece of wire, it sees a kick. See the kick? See the kick? Nazarani? So I'm just touching this piece of wire and it's repelling. It sees a force that goes outward. See? Is it 
ਲੇਕਿਨ ਮੈਂ ਵੀ ਦੇਖ ਸਕਦਾ ਓਕੇ ਆਮ ਗੋਇੰਗ ਟੂ ਨਿਊਟ੍ਰਲਾਈਜ਼ ਥਿਸ ਆਮ ਗੋਇੰਗ ਟੂ ਹੋਲਡ ਇਟ ਇਨ ਮਾਈ ਹੈਂਡ ਆਮ ਗੋਇੰਗ ਟੂ ਨਿਊਟ੍ਰਲਾਈਜ਼ ਥਿਸ ਅਬ ਆਪਨੇ ਇਸਕੋ ਟੱਚ ਕਰਨਾ ਇਸ ਵਾਇਰ ਨੂੰ ਹਾਂ ਤੂੰ ਠੀਕ ਹੈ ਓਕੇ ਟੱਚ ਕਰਕੇ ਦੇਖੋ ਨਾ ਫਿਰ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਯੂ ਫੀਲ ਦਾ ਰਿਪਲਸ਼ਨ ਦੇਖਾ ਦੇ just touch it and it feels a kick so i if i keep it static and i keep it touching it's going to bounce from away from this wire yeah now if i take this charge piece to the other side it's going to immediately neutralize first is going to stick then it's going to immediately neutralize and then pick up the same charge and be pushed back again neutralize this sticks now it feels the repulsion again okay at this end let me do this once more the neutralizes then i bring it back close i touch it starts feeling the repulsion gets these outward kicks i don't see a kick in the middle of the circuit because that's almost neutral so it just remains there all right so i couldn't find many demonstrations like this in fact any demonstration like this that that has been done it's there in textbooks I hope one day one of you could come up with a more sensitive device a more sensitive electrometer a more sensitive experiment to actually quantify these charges on the surface of the conductor so with this I would like to thank you we're going to see you on Tuesday inshallah at 8 a.m. it's going to be a quiz Tuesday after uh, Tuesday evening and we'll have a last class 